What's going on, everyone? Uh, welcome to another episode of Writing Friction. And as always, the guest today is pretty cool. Um, everyone say hello to Rebecca Mackay. What's going on, Rebecca? I'm good. I can't believe that all of your guests are cool. Every single one. Well, um, listen, uh, at this <laughs> point, um, you just got to go with the flow. Uh, some have been up, some have been down. No, they've been all cool. Um, I've been <laughs> catering it to maybe things, you know, I might, people I might get along with. Uh, sure. Okay. Why, I'll believe that. Why not? I'll um, try to break your streak. Yeah. So let's hear about you. You're over in Illinois, Chicago area right now, right? Yeah. What's, yeah, uh, what's life going, what's going on over there? <laughs> um, you know, it's, I feel like you just have to qualify everything with where we are. It's like, yeah. I'm good, but it, you know, what do I call that? Like a pandemic nine, you know, like um, good considering. Yeah. Um, oh, Ch Chicago's great right now. Um, I'm closing my door so my dog <laughs> squirrels in peace without disturbing us. Um, we're, we're both dealing with dogs and things of that nature throughout this. Yeah. Time. Um, no, life's good. I'm outside of the city, um, but okay. the city's fine. You know, yeah. it's, it's that same thing of mm -hmm. um, my relatives in Hungary, like, you know, see Chicago on the news and they write to me and they're like, oh my God, you're on fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. we're fine. Mm -hmm. It would be fun to write about. Uh, speaking yeah. of which, have you been using this time to write? I mean, I'm, you know, what's going I mean, how do you go about using your time now that, you know, a whole lot is not going on? Yeah, I mean, I'm still teaching um, about as much as I usually do, because that happens online. Um, mm -hmm. But um, a lot of travel got canceled for me. Because, yeah. uh, you know, I'm two years in on The Great Believers, but um, there's still a lot of... You're still grinding away on that? It's, you know, community reads and stuff in the US, but then this was the summer that a lot of my European translations came out. Mm -hmm. So I was supposed to be really, really busy being over yeah. there. Um, sucks to have that canceled, yeah. but... Um, I'm also really, really supposed to be writing the next book. And so, um, you know, able to do that, not on an airport floor, not jet lagged, that's helpful. Well, so, okay. Do you, do you find ever inspiration on the floor of an airport? I mean, I know I've written on the floor of an airport. Um, you know, I mean, those are like those little nuggets of time that are almost better than time at home. You know what I mean? You're just, yeah. No, I totally agree. I actually, there's a story in my story collection that I entirely wrote on an airport floor. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a very short story, but I wrote it there. Um, no, and I'm always telling my students too, like you can't expect that you're only going to work at your desk and, you know, with your cup of tea and your headphones on. Like no, you, no, no, you got to no. be cool with writing in the Starbucks mm -hmm. drive through Like, mm -hmm. And not only you have to, you know, just like find that those moments of time, but yeah, you're going to find different inspiration. You're going to write different in the Starbucks drive through mm -hmm. than you would write at your desk. You're going to see some different person standing in line at the Starbucks than you would, you know, passing yeah. by your window on the street. Yeah, um, totally. Totally. Yeah. And it's amazing how uh, something quick like that can literally lead you down a whole nother path. I mean, it's talked about, I talk about it all the time, but um, you know, again, standing in line at a Starbucks, and you know, some character walks in and you can just boom, spark. Yeah. And then, you know, record something on your voice memo or, you know, do you talk to, do you, is that part of what you talk about with your students? I mean, again, the idea of you not sitting and waiting for it to happen, but going and trying to find it yourself. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm someone, I, I understand that every writer works this way. I've never had to, you know, wait for inspiration. I'm someone with a, a radically overactive imagination. And um, it's, it you know, for me, it's, it's not a matter of, I don't know what to write. I don't yeah. know what to write about. I, I have, you know, just avalanches of stuff going on in there. Um, and it's a matter then of executing it, right? It's, yes. it's like just sitting down and doing the work. I understand not everyone's like that. I think there are people who are brilliant writers who will say, you know, that they only have a, an idea for something to write every year or two, but then they're brilliant writers. And I, I'm different. I don't get it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's like, we're all, we all dream different too. Ever, you yes. know, like our subconscious and our imagination, they're all different, but um, you know, it's, it's not so much, it's interesting because it's not so much for me necessarily about seeing the interesting thing and getting sparked at, you know, the Starbucks. It's more, what mood am I in? You know, like, am I, is there upbeat music? Am I, do I feel, am I like now, because like, you can't go in, you know, am I, do I feel kind of claustrophobic sitting in my car for half an hour 
to go through the stupid drive through mm -hmm. and then I realize it's not worth it, but it's too late to turn around. That's going to put me in a different mood to yeah. write this scene. And that's, it doesn't have to be like a happy inspiration. You know, the muse comes and lights on your shoulder. It's like, yeah. I'm frustrated and claustrophobic right now. That's going to come out in my writing, maybe in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. You know? Are you a firm believer or do you kind of go about the idea of a routine in your day? Do you write at the same exact time all the time? Mm -hmm. No, no, you don't. No, and I totally get why some people need that. Um, I, I literally, if I don't write between, you know, 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. every day, my, you know, it kind of, I'll find the time to do it. But yeah, I am that person who yeah. that time. So you're saying you don't, you can kind of just go about it. Yeah, which, you know, I, I think, you know, my life, um, it's not that my life is chaotic, but it's not the same schedule day to day, yeah. especially you know, in normal times when I'm traveling and everything, like I'm getting up at 5 a.m. to get on an airplane. Um, I can't, you know, it's just um, a pipe dream to have a schedule. What about in, well, what about in your early days? You, you know, in my early days, so I was teaching Montessori Elementary School. Mm -hmm. um, I taught for 12 years before okay. I was able to support myself with writing and, and teaching writing. Um, and I was writing the whole time, obviously. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like I, you know, it was funny because my first book came out. I was did like was just stopping teaching and people were like, why did you suddenly decide to stop being a teacher and start being a writer? Uh -huh. How long do you think it takes to write a yeah. novel? Like, yeah. what are you? Like no one starts being a stand-up comedian and then, you know, 20 years later they're on Letterman. They're like, oh, why? It's just like, yeah, yeah right. Do it all the time. Right. Um, why did you suddenly decide to go on Letterman? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I was, I was writing that whole time and especially early on in there, I didn't have my own kids yet. Okay. So, you know, it was, um, that was more being able to write at night, um, right on the weekends. I would get a lot done in the summers. It's not so much that I had a strict schedule, but I had, you know, I was really busy from eight to four every day yes. and there was no chance of writing. Yeah. And so then if I was going to, you know, if I wasn't exhausted, I would come home, um, you know, exercise, whatever, get a gin and tonic, watch the Simpsons and then go right. <laughs> Which probably did not affect my work. I got it myself for sure. Yeah. I mean, you say the Simpsons? That for This is like, I, I don't watch it anymore. It's funny, but like, you know, 15 years. Well, we all still years. watch the Simpsons somehow. I, uh, I would if it came on. I have no idea when I it's know. on. I don't know yeah, how to watch uh, it anymore. That's but yeah, it was like gin and, tonic, gin and tonic and the Simpsons at like five or whatever. It was uh, like in syndication. Uh -huh. And then I'd be like, okay, I'm going to write until dinner. I'm going to write. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. And do you try to write every day? No. No? I mean, I, I would love to. I yeah. feel great when I've written, but I, I don't think it's necessary. Um, yeah. and I feel like, um, you know, if you can, and if you need to, that's great. My least favorite writing advice out there is that if you're going to be a serious writer, you have to write every day. Mm -hmm. I just think it's just baloney. Uh -huh. Um, I think that's coming from a very privileged place, but I also think it's, I think it's unhelpful. Like, I think you need fallow periods. You don't need to sit there and it, you know, and it, of course, then when people say that what they mean by writing is typing, um, you know, you typing does not equal writing and writing does not equal typing. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about my book every day. You put the words out of my mouth. I mean, I call it writing on the run. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah. We talked before the podcast, I own a dog walking business. I, there are times you know, I'm in the woods by myself with yeah. dogs. and when, if an idea pops in my head or if I'm working on something earlier in the day and I can get on my little phone, my notepad, and even just write a sentence. It, mm -hmm. You have to just, you got to go with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I was, you know, I, I was just, I dropped my kid off at school and then I was walking to get coffee and I, I kind of, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking constantly about the novel. Yeah. Um, haven't written yet today. I will. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I sort of figured just, wasn't even trying, but found a way out of a scene that I was having trouble with of like, oh, wait, she can just jump back and do what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think when people think that like, I need to write every day, what they think they mean or what they think they need is to sit there typing a certain number of words every day, which is not always the work that needs to be done. And then those writers, I see when they're my students, um, they feel guilty taking time to do stuff like outline. Or, yeah. <laughs> well, I feel guilty about everything, but I'm Jewish, so that's just it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, 
you know, like, yeah, like, like, it's like, well, I'm not, I, you know, I, I, I can't take the time to do exploratory stuff. I can't take the time to research. I can't take the time to outline because I have to write my thousand words a day or my 500 yeah. words a day. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, you have a typing goal. That's really interesting, but that's not the bulk of the work that you need to be I mean, doing. it could equal bad work, right? And bad oh, work. Yeah. Um, right, because you, you don't let yourself stop to outline or do that other stuff and you're just plowing ahead over the cliff. Like <laughs> you're going to waste years actually doing this if you don't stop and take a couple days. I mean, the amount of times, you know, again, I'm still a relatively new writer. I just, my, my first book got published literally three weeks before the world shut down. Oh and God. Then, it's, all, it's all good. Um, but uh, that being said, yet when I was working on that book, you know, the amount of times where I was, you know, 20 minutes went by and I was working on, same two sentences and i'm like you know what it would just be better if i highlighted it and press yeah. delete and now it's better yeah uh, you know and again it's time you know you're talking about the time to write writing on airport floors and you know and air whatever um time is so precious in everyone's lives and especially i'm imagining your students too because they're not only doing writing they're probably doing other things right. Um, right. You know, the economy of time yeah you know, the value of time especially you know if you have a you know a family and th- it, it yeah. I'm a single dude living in San Francisco with a dog. I have a lot of time, um, <laughs> but I still, you know, I prioritize my time. And with writing, you know. Yeah. You well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think that um, my writing students, and it tends to be either grad students or other, you know, really experienced adult writers. Um, and so they're, you know, they're working very seriously on usually a first book. Okay. Um, and you know, once in a while, I'll get someone who goes, I've taken the year off from my job, I'm just gonna do this or um, whatever it is. And that's great, but but 99% of the time, um, people working on a first book, these are people with um, serious, you know, so, you know, some people have this bubble of time. It's, it's always temporary if they do, but 99% of my students and of anyone writing a first book, they have serious career, job, family obligations that they're writing around. Um, I think it's useful for people to know that, that they're not alone in that. Because mm-hmm. people have this idea sometimes of like, oh, but real writers have a cabin in the woods and I'm trying to write on the train. Um, poor me. And like, no, that's, that's how it works for everybody. It really is. <laughs> um, I, I, I tell the story ad nauseum and everyone's sick of hearing it, but uh, you know Adam Johnson, the author? Yeah. He lives four blocks away from me. Um, oh, cool. And I ran into him. Uh, he, he he's a pretty unassuming guy, and I wouldn't have never known who he was if I hadn't have like read the little interview in the back of the hardcover of Orphan Master's Son that had a little black and white photo of him. Yeah, and I see him in my dog van, and I, I yell out his name. He looks at me. He's like, "Who the fuck?" Are you? And <laughs> I have this conversation with him for like thirty minutes. Oh my um, god! And I ask him the same question. I'm, I'm we're talking about right now. And he's just like, you know, I don't have this bubble of time anymore. Um, he's like, you know, I have so many obligations now outside of the writing. Right. Um, and you know, he probably doesn't get asked that question a lot. I feel like a lot of authors don't get asked this question a lot of just like, you know, how do you, you got to do it. Like when you do it, you got to squeeze in, you know, I write when I'm doing the laundry on top of, you know, a washing machine. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, in, in this bubble of time, not everyone has that. Most people don't have that. Because right. then I think the assumption is that the people who have that time are the people who've had some success. Okay. The thing is, you get some success and, um, you know, the main way actually that you're making most of your money is speaking engagements, yeah. um, like music. a conference, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, and or you're doing things because, you, you know, you want to, you need to, you want to help people. You don't want to go, you don't want to go live in an ashram and write your next novel, you know? I mean, maybe I do, but. <laughs> you know, it could mean, I mean, I think I emailed Richard Powers and he got back to me and he, he was like, I want to do it. He's like, I literally live on a mountaintop in Southern Appalachia. He's Whoa. like, I have nothing. He's like, I have, I can use like a stick with a, you know, piece of metal <laughs> on top and try to get reception. Oh my um, God. You know, wow. That, that exists, I guess, but it's also 2020 that, you know, this is not, you know, 1965 East Village, Manhattan. Um, right. You know, it, it's a different time. People have to work in different ways because there's so much shit going on outside yeah. of everything else. Yeah. Um, and you made an interesting point about, you know, authors, 
you know, speaking engagements and how, you know, and that's, let's just call it what it is. I mean, it's part of the business and it's a profitable part of your business. Um, you know, again, I mentioned musicians, like I have, I've been touring in bands forever and, you know, no yeah. music to play in gigs right now. You know, and that's how they're making their money. Um, you know, they're, they're writing music and stuff. But yeah, I mean, can you talk more about that? Can you just talk about the idea of, you know, again, like being an author on the road and kind of pushing your book and kind of, you know, yeah. Again, you, you, we started, you said two years in and you're still pushing the book. So absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, at a, you know, this is my fourth book. So I've definitely, this has not been, you know, the way it's worked for all my books. Uh -huh. Um, but this, you know, the great believers was by far my most successful book and it, it's still, you know, people are still wanting to talk about it and I'm thrilled about that. Um, it's partly, you know, the book comes out, and you're doing everything you can, often for free or on your publisher's dime. You're going wherever just to blitz the book out there. Um, and then, you know, at a certain point, um, and, and this, you know, didn't happen right away, um, there's this next uh, kind of wave of, you know, visiting universities, speaking at a conference, um, you know, everything from like, you know, you got your hands, you get head in your hand, literally talking. I kind of, it. I know, I kind of do. It's funny because I'm so grateful. And then it's like, and course, even right now when it's not happening, it's of exhausting course. to think about. Yeah, of but course. yeah, it's great. It's, you know, speak at this charity luncheon, we'll pay you this much money. Yeah. Um, come teach at a conference, et cetera. Yeah. And um, some of those things are, really cool professionally. Like I'm going to go, you know, I'm taught at, for instance, like the Tin House Writers Conference. Yeah. I'm making great friends with other writers. Um, it's, you know, really good audience to get my book to. Um, I'm having a blast. It is good for connections and whatever on top yeah. of being really, really fun. Um, other things, it's more, you know, I don't really get that much out of speaking at the ladies auxiliary luncheon for the garden club or whatever. I'm sure it's a nice, there's a nice appetizer, I'm sure. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Glass of wine. Um, but it's like, okay, this is, you know, can I squeeze it in? Yeah. And, and yeah. you do enough of those and it's paying the bills regardless of when my next book gets done, yeah. regardless of, you know, whether, you know, cause it's one thing to say like, I get, you know, this book did okay, but the next book, who knows? It might not, it mm -hmm. might, um, maybe I realize after spending three, four years on it that this is not a book I want to publish. Um, or I do and nobody wants to read it. So, <laughs> so I mean, again, okay. So again, so everyone who's listening to this, right. We they've listened to people to me talk about not having any success and now to a successful author talking about her success, no matter what doubt will always be there in some form. Yeah. yeah if, no, yeah. We're not releasing the video of this, but if you can see Rebecca's face, you'd understand what I was saying. And <laughs> there's always doubt is in anything you do, anything you do. Um, and you said, you know, the idea of scrapping a novel you worked three, four years on. I mean, I taught, I talked to Michael Ferris Smith a couple of days ago and he said he wrote his first book and then he literally threw it in the dumpster. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's um, my friend, Michael Zapata, who's here in Chicago. He just had a brilliant debut. Um, I interviewed him at like a couple weeks ago at an out. It was amazing because it was in person, but we were like outdoors on a stage with everyone spread out on this. Lawn. Yeah. But um, he, his first novel that he wrote, he ended up dumping it literally into a volcano. Oy vey. Just to be dramatic, you know, he was like, he could like hike to climb this volcano and he's like, I'm gonna throw my only copy of this manuscript into the volcano. I, mean, um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, that's, <laughs> to each their own. I mean, but you don't, I mean, you're joking around when you say this, right? I mean, obviously you 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 believe in your work and yeah. Well, what it, actually what it is, is I'm, I'm, I'm actually not an abandoner. I've abandoned even very, very few short stories. Yeah. Um, I just, I feel way. like, yeah, yeah, you get it. It's, it's not, cause it's not an, an idea for a novel or a story is not fundamentally faulty. Um, you know, any idea for a novel, if you describe it, sounds bananas. You know, if I'm like, I'm gonna write a novel about this, this crazy doctor who digs up dead bodies and he puts them together and he makes this monster and he, that's stupid. Uh, now we know <laughs> right? how Stephen King feels, right? Yeah. What's that? So now we know how Stephen King feels, right? I mean- Wait, Well, yeah, no, I mean, it's like, right? You you give the, the plot of any, you give the plot of Hamlet, like this ghost comes and it's like, that's 
a bad plot. Yeah. But, the, and I'm, but what I, you know, it sounds stupid until you execute it brilliantly. Oh yeah. And any idea for anything like this, it's it's all, unless there's something fundamentally racist or something about it. Of course, yeah. Those, these are all fixable things. These are all executable ideas. And so for me, it's, it's, you know, I think the only thing that would really make me abandon a project is if I felt genuinely disconnected from it. Mm-hmm. Just really like, I, I don't care about this at all anymore. Yeah. And that really doesn't tend to happen. It, once in a while, it'll happen with a short story. But um, if I've invested that much in a novel, it might be that I need to start over. It might need, mean I need to take two more years. It might mean I need to, um, you know, come at it from a completely different angle. But it's not, do I need to delete it and start yeah. do something else? It's not going to be any easier with another topic. Only with another work book. on one thing at a time? Um, no, I, mm, I tend to only actively work on one novel at a time, although there have been exceptions. Um, but at any given time, I'll have a novel and I'll probably also have a couple of short stories on the of back course, burner, yeah. sometimes commissioned things. You know, I just, I, you know, I do some, I write some articles for Chicago Magazine. Those are reportage. Yeah. Um, I had a commissioned essay a few weeks ago. So that stuff's going on. And then um, what tends to happen with me is that as I'm, I, I, I'm not nearing completion. I don't want to misspeak on this current novel, but I'm kind of, I've made most of my decisions. And I'm just rolling the ball forward and I'm, I'm hoping to be done by next summer. Um, at that point, the more generative part of my brain starts really working on the next project. Mm-hmm. Um, so at this point, I know what the next novel is. So I'm, I'm thinking two novels ahead. Um, I'm really excited about it. I'm not thinking about it every day, you know, not living it in, in the same way, but it's, it's percolating it's, well, it's like a stock market. It's like slow gains in the stock market, right? Yeah, like yeah. You, you, like you invest in McDonald's and then 30 years later you check it. Um, <laughs> well, that's what it's like, right? So you're saying yeah. it's percolating. And that's exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, and again, it's, again, people listening, it's just in your head, always working the ideas around. It's like a, a thick little stew. Uh, <laughs> He's literally actually, stirring his head right now on Zoom. I want everyone to know. Yeah, and Reba is, Reba is <laughs> out cold. On my lap. Um, yeah, but no, again, yeah, just constantly. Uh, when you, I, I ask this question a lot, when you start a book or a short story or whatever, do you know the end already? No. Ah, okay. Yeah, talk about um, that. You know, it's, ah, um, occasionally, I think I, I always have an idea of where it's going to end. And then if I land right exactly there, that's a little concerning, actually. Uh-huh. Um, that, you know, if, if I could have predicted from page one where this was going to land, have I written a predictable book? Oh, have, I okay. an easy okay. book? have I even learned anything by writing this? Does it contain surprise? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, was just, I was talking to a scientist friend the other day and kind of about that concept. And he was like, yeah, if he's like, if, if all of my hypotheses turned out to be correct, I would know that I was doing something wrong. Like either I was rigging the experiment or I was doing really dumb experiments, Mm -hmm. you know, like maybe some of them, but not, not all of them. And, you know, once in a while, a story will land where I thought it was going to, but um, I'm always delighted when things turn and I find myself in unexpected territory because that means I've grown. I've done something that I wasn't expecting to do. It's not the most predictable landing place. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, at the same time, I tend to know, you know, at at a certain point in writing, you're going to articulate to yourself, what the main question of the book is. What is the main crisis? What's the main thing being asked? What are we waiting to find out? And so I will know that that is what we're leading to, but I don't necessarily know how that's going to turn, you know, like, okay, either she's going to leave the convent or she's going to stay. <laughs> this is not the novel I'm writing. Um, and I know the, although I wish it were now. Um, yeah. I know that, you know, the climax of the story, the place that I'm leading to is the ultimate final decision on this. Whether I know which way it's going to go, what all the factors are going to be, hopefully not. Uh-huh. And it's just when, 
a lot of authors, and again, in the beginning of this conversation, we talked about the idea of waiting in line at Starbucks and a character walks in, right? And it, it can be just at that right moment where in your mind, you're thinking about something, you know, of the character walking out of the convent. But now instead of the character, this character walks into yeah. the convent and boom, now you can, you know, so you're always having that. But a lot of people, you know, the idea of like, I'm looking at, um, I, I, I got a new painting on my wall. And it's a it's a, it's on a canvas, but the idea that that before that painting was on that canvas, it was blank, and the idea of that blank canvas, that blank paper, a lot of people can get kind of anxious yeah. about that. But to yeah. me, that that's like swimming in the ocean. Like I, I see an ocean in front of me. I see infinite possibilities when I see a blank page. Um, yeah. And the idea of you know not being able to you know know the end of the book. Um, good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, my dog. Now my dog wants back in. <laughs> you, can let, you can let her in. It's all good. Okay. I'm, sure. Okay. You know, right. And right. yeah, but people listening, the idea of like that idea of the blank, you know, canvas in front of you, you just gotta like go forward with it. Um, yeah. it, it it's the idea of writing four sentences and deleting three and having one. Yeah. 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 And you know, I, I think, um, when you throw yourself a monkey wrench or when the work throws you a monkey wrench, um, that is the moment usually where um, you veer off. You know, I, I think that if you, if you go into a work completely, you know, planning everything out and then you execute it exactly, yeah. um, you're not, it, it's just, it never is going to be surprising. Mm -hmm. It's never, you know, it's, it's all, our subconsciouses all work so similarly. And if you think about like once in a while, I have a really weird dream, but then, or especially if it's like a repeating dream or something, I'll Google it. Everyone has that dream. Uh -huh, yeah, it, yeah. Uh -huh. It's not something that normally, it's not something like that- Like losing your teeth means you, you don't have enough money, you're worried about money or, yeah. Something like that, uh -huh. yeah. Even things that could never even happen to you. I used to yeah. have this dream all the time about um, fish swimming around in the air. That's not a thing that happens. No. I Google it. It's a common dream. Yeah. Yeah. Why the hell is that a common dream? But subconsciously, we're very, very similarly wired. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, you go in- to that, you know, you have a completely blank canvas and it stays blank. You go in and you just kind of go with your gut on the first most obvious thing that comes to you. It's probably going to be the first most obvious thing that would come to anyone, mm -hmm. to be honest, right? I mean, we're all weird, but we're not that weird. Matilda, shush. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> the dogs are barking. I don't know. This might be might be the calling card. And I think it's funny. Reba woke up from that. <laughs> oh. it's um, well, and it's all right. No, Zoom's giving us, and it's almost going to give me the boot. Um, we're back. This was a, a great combo. I, we could probably talk for another hour, probably. Um, do you want to let people know some things real quick before, you know, what you're doing right now? Are you doing any yeah. kind of virtual things or? I am, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the artistic director at a place called Story Studio here in Chicago, which is a nonprofit writing arts center. Um, I teach some classes there, but I'm also the one curating the whole slate of now entirely online classes. So we okay. have, you know, one night seminars from incredible people. We have um, Therese Mailhot coming up, um, just incredible, like, amazing authors. Yeah. Um, oh, Patricia Smith, the poet is coming up. She's brilliant. Um, so yeah, if you look up Story Studio, you can find some stuff I'm doing, but also stuff that I've like selected <laughs> that I think people, I like writers that I trust to be great teachers. Uh -huh. um, I, um, yeah, my, you know, The Great Believers obviously is out now. Oh, you know, one really cool thing. My story collection, Music for Wartime, um, which came I out- I love the title of. Oh, thanks. Came out in 2015. They just did it on audio. Oh, like sweet. A few weeks ago. Yeah, and they got like five different actors. So the, the book industry is doing a great job of supporting a lot of out-of-work actors right now with audiobooks. And so I'm saying this, like, I, I'm not going to ever earn royalties on this short story collection. This is not yeah. about me, but the, I want them to, I want the publishers to feel like they, the actors um, were, you know, like deserved, like, I want them to keep doing this, basically. I, I want them to keep hiring actors. In, so in, another, world, in another world, when I, in my early twenties, in um, I'm from New Jersey, but I worked in Manhattan doing um, exactly that, uh, but on the audio side. So I was recording those voices. Oh, cool! Yeah, and I did. You know, I did a couple of Ken Burns documentaries and you know, dozens of audio books. Yeah, I've been in that recording booth 
Yeah. When, you know, when the actor and the producers behind me breathing down our necks and, you know, oh it's they work so hard. These are, yeah. and like, they really make a difference in the life of a book, honestly. Oh, yeah, um, sure. yeah. I mean, audiobooks are huge. And, and it's cool to hear that you're a fan of audiobooks. Oh, I am. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, it was a learning curve for me. I, I didn't, I had a hard time focusing at first on audiobooks and I've, I've learned um, how I need to do it. And mm -hmm. like, I play it on a faster speed. It helps me actually. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan now, but um, yes, this is a great time to download audiobooks and people can do it. Um, if people do like Libro FM in specific for their app that benefits indie bookstores. So um, you don't have to be throwing your money yeah, at. We'll put, we'll you put a link for that. You said Libro FM? Yeah, Libro. It's like Libro.fm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can like choose your favorite indie bookstore. And then when you download an e uh, audiobook, the money goes to them, great. which is I, great. And then you're supporting actors. It's a whole it's point. Cool. Yeah. yeah. At this point, that's, that's the whole idea. Um, yeah. Again, like Zoom is telling me that they don't like me anymore. Uh, Rebecca, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. This was really fun. Yeah, yeah I'm sure hopefully we'll do it again sometime. And um, yeah. it looks like it's a beautiful day out by you. So please enjoy it your is. weekend. Absolutely. Enjoy that puppy. Ah, uh, she's giving me the look right now. <laughs> <laughs> Go later. Right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.